So the good, the bad, and the very tall. Um, I think that's been a discerning future. Because of the lag, of course, many of these buildings haven't yet been built, but I'm sure they will be. Um, now, these are all proposals. Um, London Bridge Tower, the Shard, um, will arise to 310 metres. Now, that is apparently the finance is all in place. That's expected to be completed by 2012. The, the top um, on your right, that's um, a proposal for Croydon. And um, at the bottom um, on the right is uh, Raphael... Vinoli's spark plug, um, as it being, well, that's obviously the fashion in London that we, 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 criti we give names to all the new buildings. Um, but there are many, many more in the pipeline, um, particularly. And what's interesting is they think that the commercial towers want to cluster together, and there's a rationale that makes sense in um, design terms of having clusters of high buildings in the city, for example. Um, but of course, residential developments, they, the whole point is to sell the view. And so you don't want somebody immediately next door, you want to be spread out. And I think, I, I think there's something like 15 proposals just for the bit of the Thames from Vauxhall to um, um, sort of uh, Waterloo. And so we, we could end up with this sort of dragon's teeth of uh, buildings um, um, along the river. So why haven't we done better? There's been, well, here are a few reasons. There's been huge development pressure um, allied with um, plans which are often out of date. I mean, I'm a planner, so I'm not knocking planning, but um, it is a slow system whereas the development industry has been pretty fleet of foot and quick to take advantages of gaps in the planning system. The money involved is so huge, it's been worth taking a punt, um, just, and there's been something of a free-for-all. Um, I think it's fair to say, you may disagree, there's been a lack of confidence in some areas to make decisions. It's very difficult to say no unless you're absolutely sure of your ground, and you've got the backup in the planning system. There is, again, not everywhere, but there is a lack of knowledge and skills about what good design looks like, how to do good conservation, and um, simply a lack of capacity. And above all, there's been this huge political imperative to secure development and regeneration almost at any price. Um, on the one hand, there's been the sort of boom in financial services. Um, there was the boom in financial services, um, and the pressure to secure more and more development allied with um, the need to provide huge numbers of new housing. So the scale and pressure of development has been huge. Um, so here are some of the myths and excuses you will be familiar with. Um, I think it suited the mood of the times to portray conservation as stuffy, standing in the way of progress, damaging London's economy, old-fashioned, anti-modern, too expensive. We've heard them all. Um, and it suited, as I say, it suited the mood of the times to put, portray conservation in this way. Um, and the, the scale of profit to be made um, was such that fighting appeals or mounting legal challenge challenges were small beer for developers. Good design, some of the arguments we're familiar with, it's all too subjective, it's just a matter of taste. And it's too, ex it's, um, you know, if someone's prepared to pay for it and engage an international star architect, it must be good. Um, it must certainly be good enough. So we have this sort of paradox in London of some very striking, sometimes elegant, uh, sometimes ugly, but distinctive buildings being proposed by internationally recognized architects, but which are completely out of context. And that's where I think the conflict comes between design and um, conservation. In my view, the design, good design should, should um, respect its context. Now, 
that's an area that's difficult in London when you're talking about city scale, but the impact of some of these proposals are so immense and so much greater than their immediate areas. They become strategic questions. So, in response to the pressures, English Heritage and CAVE have been working hard to do what we can to advise and influence others in order to secure better outcomes. <coughs> and we've all agreed that you need <coughs> we need to be smarter in making the case and marshalling the arguments. And Didier talked about the importance of marshalling the arguments in your stadium um, example. And these are sort of just three pieces of work that I'm going to touch on briefly. Um, two con um, English heritage examples, conservation principles, seeing history in the view, and the CAVE English heritage guidance on tall buildings. So let's start with conservation principles. This is work that English heritage has been undertaking over the last couple of years um, to provide an intellectual framework, really, for conservation. Um, and to understand, to get a better understanding of significance through the understanding of heritage values. And we've classified these into four, um, ca four categories. There's evidential value, for example, the value that might be from an archaeological site. There's historic value, there's aesthetic value and communal value. And some places and buildings exhibit all those um, but this is a useful way of considering a um, um, sort of underlying set of principles that we at English Heritage use um, in throughout a lot, most of our work. And we think it's the starting point, this values-based approach is the starting point for managing change to the historic environment. And we call this practice constructive conservation. And we... In December, we produced a new um, publication explaining this in a bit more detail. And if you're interested, you can, um, you can download it off the English Heritage website or the HELM website. And um, the central idea is, um, is basically how we can manage change. It's about the sustainable management of the historic environment and about stimulating greater awareness of how historic places can support regeneration, placemaking and community development. It's about a positive and collaborative approach to conservation, not a conflict-based approach. And it's about recognizing the historic significance of places and actively managing and accommodating change. And what it, what it often means is by doing a very careful assessment of significance, it can be possible to say, well, this is the most significant part of a place, and this part is of lesser significance. And in order to get, in order to protect the most significant parts of a place or of a building, um, it may be acceptable to allow um, new interventions. Um, but it's all based on this, this better understanding of the values. And so here we have the Regent's Palace Hotel at Piccadilly Circus, which is a 1915 Beaux-Arts Baroque structure with some Art Deco features, listed grade two. The initial plans by the Crown Estate involved its total demolition, but we assessed at English Heritage where the building's heritage values lay understood what the Crown Estate wanted to achieve and with the help of working closely with Westminster City Council, we suggested ways of creating a viable um, scheme which has new elements but maintains this important part of the, of, the, of, the, of the facade and the corner. Similarly, the scheme, um, the Claw Learning Centre at Hampton Court is a new education facility sited within the historic Royal Palace site. Um, it works with the grain of the existing landscape, historic landscape, to create a development that far from concealing the historic significance, reinforces it. 
Another example which I've been personally involved in a great deal, wearing my hat as Chair of English Heritage's London Advisory Committee, is King's Cross, the King's Cross Railway Land. Now, this is, I think, a great example of a place that has got a huge amount of memory and historic significance. It, was, it is the most spectacular Victorian transport interchange, effectively that's really not seen the light of day for about 100 years. And if you haven't been, when you get the opportunity, do go. It came as a complete revelation to me. Um, now, the plans for King's Cross will create a complete new quarter for London. Um, it's a 53-acre brownfield site. It's got 20 historic buildings on it. We had extensive pre-application discussions with the developer Argent and the London Borough of Camden at master planning stage. And what we agreed in the end by deciding where the most significant parts of the development of the site lay, we were able, it was controversial and not everybody agreed, but we were able to allow a couple of um, lesser, uh, lists of buildings of lesser significant to be demolished in order to allow for the necessary redevelopment of the scheme, of the, of the area. And this is what it will look like. And the contract has just been signed for the granary building, which is the one at the bottom, which is going to be the new home for St. Martin's College of Art, and a new public square in front of it. And you'll see on the top right-hand corner the list of gas holders, which are currently in storage. Um, two of them are going to be housing um, schemes um, reflecting the sense of the gas holders. Um, the third one of the gas in the gas holders, the third one's going to be a park, and I think it's going to be an absolutely stunning, um, a stunning new area of London, which reveals those memories and the importance of that historic environment whilst also creating a new place which is informed by um, that strong, muscular and robust set of industrial buildings and spaces. The second example of this is Crystal Palace, and um, particularly at the National Sports Centre. This is an early example of concrete brutalism <coughs> designed by LCC architects in 1964. It's listed grade two star. It was the first purpose-built sports centre in London. Now, the park um, came into the ownership of the London Development Agency and they've got great plans for restoring the historic landscape. The plan for the sports centre was complete demolition to be replaced by a new leisure centre um, nearer the entrance to the park and with the provision of hard surfaces, floodlit surfaces for five-a-side football. Again, we had a sort of working group with the developers and we threw around some ideas and what we decided was the most significant part of this building was its sense of being a pavilion in the park, its, its, um, its presence in the park, but also its very, very strong and powerful internal um, architecture. <laughs> Anyway, the solution we came up with, which has been adopted, is simply to deck over the swimming pool and create essentially a large barn, which would be perfect for five-a-side football and those kind of activities. So not only have we got secured a new use for the building, we've stopped what would be an intrusive um, development in the park. Now, this is all for the future because at the moment they suddenly realise, well, actually, with the Olympics coming up, it would be a good idea to have an Olympic-sized swimming pool in, um, um, in action, so to speak. So this is post-Olympics, but that's the solution that, that we've agreed, and that's, I think, a very good example of constructive conservation. The second... How am I doing? Tell me if I've done too much. Um, the second example is tall buildings. Um, and um, the tall buildings guidance, which Cave and English Heritage updated in July 2007. Now, this advocates a development plan approach. This has been sorely lacking in London. Most boroughs do not have tall buildings policies in place. The, um, 
Um, and so without that development plan approach, as I say, I think there's been a free-for-all. What the guidance does, though, is set out some evaluation criteria, um, historic context, architectural quality, sustainable design, etc. And this document has carried um, quite a lot of weight at appeals and what have you. The issue, though, as in London has been more complicated. And it's what I talked about earlier, is how do you um, reconcile these conflicts between the new and the old on this sort of, when you've got this scale of development. When Didier said that in France there's a, or with you Sebastian, 50, uh, was it 500, 500. metre um, exclusion zone around listed buildings, I mean you wouldn't build anything in London. Um, you know, I mean it just wouldn't work. So, um, but assessing where that balance lies between um, conservation and, and, and sort of new design and it, it is a really tricky one um, and we've not had wearing my English heritage hat we've not had a really very good experience um, so this is the shard um, in this case we um, objected to the scheme not because we thought Renzo Piano's design was a bad design but because of the impact this project will have on the Tower of London World Heritage Site and on the views of St Paul's from um, um, Primrose Hill where it's in the background. We thought those, that harm to the historic environment outweighed the benefits of the building. We didn't convince the inspector who acknowledged there was some harm but thought the other way, the benefits outweighed the harm and, so, and we didn't convince the Secretary of State. So we will see who is right, history will tell us who is right. The second example is um, 20 Fenchurch Street, the walkie-talkie, um, where, again, we didn't actually at English Heritage ask for this scheme to be called in, but it was called in because of the impact on the World Heritage, the Tower of London World Heritage site. We argued it would cause some, not a great deal of harm to the World Heritage site, but it had, we felt it was harmful to the London skyline. Um, again, the inspector didn't agree, um, and neither did the Secretary of State. Fortunately, I was not a CABE commissioner at that point because CABE spoke in favour of this building and English Heritage spoke against it. So that was a conflict I didn't have to resolve in my own mind. Another example is the Vauxhall Tower. Uh, again, now this is different because in this case, we did convince the inspector that this tower um, would cause damage to the Westminster World Heritage Site because it is visible. The inspector agreed with us. Unfortunately, the Secretary of State didn't agree with his inspector, thought that particularly the amount of affordable housing it would provide outweighed the impact on the historic environment. And fi the, the, fi okay, the, fi the final example is Dune Street um, on the South Bank. This is a rather elegant building. Um, the problem is it appears in that um, view of Somerset House I showed you early, which is this perfect 18th century ensemble with this beautifully preserved um, building against the sky. And if this building's built, you'll then see that sticking up. And you will also, it's going to be a looming presence in St. James's Park. Now, in this case, again, we convinced the inspector, but not the Secretary of State, who felt the social benefits in this case, i.e. a swimming pool, um, outweighed the harm to this historic environment. This is one we've, we are mounting a legal challenge to, on the Secretary of State's decision because we think she's got the law wrong. So that will be in court in June. So, we, we've realised from this experience we needed to do more work. And it very much chimes in to what Didier was saying about what's special about places. And it was what I was talking about earlier in constructive conservation. In this case, we've taken this work to views that we realised it's not enough to say this tall building will have an impact. We have to say what sort of impact will have and what are the values and qualities of the historic environment. So we've developed a methodology which is firstly about 
the qualities of the place and, and setting out what the values, the historic values of, in this case, that particular view of the Tower of London World Heritage Site are. And then, having done that, to then say, well, what is the impact of a tall building? So it's a methodology that we've devised for English Heritage's own use, and we are willing to share with developers because it will explain where we are coming from. What's actually happening at the moment is we're working with the Mayor of London, who's also developing the work that was done on managing London views, and we're hoping this kind of thinking will get incorporated into, um, in, into the revised London plan. Right, well, I'm more or less at the end. I'm just going to whiz through this. I really just wanted to say, although we're now you know, to a recession, there's still some great opportunities in London where we can bring together historic um, conservation and good design. This is an example, um, Whitechapel Road, where we're working with other partners to create a high street, to enhance the high street in time for the Olympics. Crossrail, huge impact on London in many ways, but there is a great, again, a great opportunity to create some good new public spaces in London um, and to perhaps demolish some of the less significant bits. Um, and this is Oxford Circus, an opportunity to do something about Oxford Circus. And we know it can be done. Here's Kensington High Street, the sort of achievements, that, that can, the improvements that can be made. We're working with the mayor, um, as I say, wearing my new hat. I'm looking forward to working with him, and hopefully we'll see a bit more emphasis given to the value of the historic environment rather than simply, if it's big, if it's tall, it must be good. Um, we're working with London boroughs, wearing both my hats, and Esther will know that at CABE we're doing a lot of work with, um, with boroughs on how you get design quality embedded in their lo in d local development frameworks. So in conclusion, maybe the recession will give us time to a bit of a breathing space. And maybe there will be a change in attitudes, a shift from excess and bling and flashy buildings and shiny new things to some enduring values. Maybe we'll have a bit more of a sort of thrifty, low-carbon lifestyle with old as the new new, of course we need to hold our nerve because there'll be huge pressures to dumb down. Um, and I think we need to resist, really resist that. And I was talking to um, the Homes and Communities Agency um, senior people yesterday and they were saying the same thing, that they're determined they're not going to dumb down. And the public sector is in a strong position because it's the only show in town in many um, areas. So I think we shouldn't be, you know, we should be very clear about what we want. We know what's gone wrong and we need to make sure we get it right. And maybe we've got a bit of, a bit of time to do it. But it, we need, and local authorities, I think we need good leadership, we need a stronger evidence base, we need to work on our expertise, and we need to engage to reduce the sort of conflicts um, I've alluded to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very, very much.